Wow, if that doesn't wet the spirit, I don't know what will. Marvelous, thank you. Our scripture for today comes from the Gospel of Luke, and we'll be reading verses 25 to 28. It's, it's part of a longer uh, d- discourse by Jesus in answer to the questions of the people. You've heard much of the message already in the music wonderfully selected for this morning. But let's focus in on verses 25 to 28 of Luke, the 21st chapter. Let's hear this word of the Lord. There will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars. On the earth, nations will be in anguish and perplexity at the roaring and tossing of the sea. People will faint from terror apprehensive of what is coming on the world, for the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. When these things begin to take place, stand up and lift up your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. When these things begin to take place. May God add his blessing to this reading of his word. Let's pray. Lord our God, you are so gracious and so good that you have promised every time your word goes forth it will accomplish the purpose for which you send it out. And so we claim that promise now. So we focus our heart upon your word. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The last few years have been, if nothing else, challenging. None of us could ever have anticipated or predicted the barrage of events and circumstances that have occurred with and since the arrival of COVID. So I'm not surprised that I often hear the question, do you think the end is near? Are we in the final days? Or even the statement of, Do you think now's the time Jesus will come again? And the amazing thing is, we're not the first to ask those questions. We're not the first to wonder. We too, along with the people of Jesus' day, wonder when will God come in all his fullness to usher in his kingdom. They asked the same thing. So in his gospel, Luke recorded these words of Jesus that we just read. And the essence of it is, I think, Jesus simply saying, there is a time. There is a time. First of all, there is a time when. Again, verses 25 and 26. There will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars. On the earth, nations will be in anguish and perplexity at the roaring and tossing of the sea. People will faint from terror, apprehensive of what is coming on the world, for the heavenly bodies will be shaken. Some years later, after Jesus had risen and ascended and was seated in glory. Life was once again difficult. People again wondered, when? And Paul responded as he wrote Timothy, 2 Timothy 3, beginning in verse 1. But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, have nothing to do with such people. I think we know that feeling and those emotions. It appears that our whole world is coming apart at the seams. The arrival and spread of the COVID pandemic and all the effects that we've been living with since, the political upheaval, the rioting and violence in our streets, the denigrating and destructive incivility, the aggressive, hate-filled personal attacks on one another, the war in Ukraine and Middle East and other places, gang violence in Haiti, Children being kidnapped, sold into slavery, increasing persecution of Christians around the world, the damage of death-producing storms, a breakdown in society and all of our family relationships. 
Human power keeps failing. Nuclear weaponry again looms large. The moral and social norms of society are decaying. Political powers are polarized like never before. Brutality seems to escalate daily. It seems as if our world is hopeless. You can add much more to the list, I'm sure. But we also feel that hopelessness in our personal lives. The doctor says, you have cancer. The pink slip carries your name. The officer at the door says, I'm sorry to inform you that your husband, wife, child is dead. A loved one cries out, I have Parkinson's, I have ALS. There's the signature on the divorce papers as the reality sinks in. Where you see the big red F on that final exam and your heart sinks. Your name is not on the final roster of players or on those who made the cast. People are barred from speaking and sharing their thoughts in public. The Bible is mocked as useless, rejected as authoritative. It's easy to be tired and worn out. We long to be liberated from our brokenness and to experience redemption for ourselves and for our relationships and for our world. We long for a perfected world. And so we too ask, when will Jesus come in all of his fullness to usher in the kingdom? And Jesus answers, and he reminds us that there is a time. There is a time now for hope. Verse 27, at that time they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. When the whole creation is in an uproar, he will come. Is the time near? We don't know. Jesus never really answers that question. To him, that's not the most important thing. What's important is we know Jesus died and rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and he's seated on the throne and he is coming again. And so we are driven by hope. And that's a good thing because hope is essential to the human soul and psyche. Without hope, we lose our zeal and our purpose for living. Think about it. It's hope that energizes the day. Imagine the young couple married for several years, unable to bear children. Having gone through the long, drawn-out process of applying for adoption, they waited anxiously for several more years for a child to come. And now on this day, they know they're going to get that phone call that says, they're here, come get them. Hope energizes their day. Hope prompts working and dreaming. Picture the young boy dribbling, shaking, finally jumping and shooting, trying to be just like Steph Curry. By the way, the Curry name, I'd like to say I'm related, but I'm not. <laughs> Hope prompts working and dreaming. Hope encourages discipline. Watch the young girl who's just seen another performance by Simone Biles knowing that someday she's going to perform just like that. And so she's practicing with great and even monotonous regularity. Hope energizes discipline. Hope also kindles perseverance. Listen to the young husband chat on the phone with his wife late at night. He says he still has two or three more hours of work before he can come home. But they know that that's the price to pay for starting their own business. But they hang on because they can taste the day when the business takes off and he can hire more help and spend more time with his wife. Hope kindles their perseverance. And hope inspires courage. Observe the young couple, glassy-eyed as they look at each other on their wedding day. Hopes of love, glory, Success, make this the greatest moment of their lives. And without that hope, they wouldn't dare enter into that relationship. Hope inspires their courage. 
Yes, hope. Hope is essential. I don't know if they still do it, but I'm sure some of you can remember, as I do, that when we were young, we would take a little magnifying glass and get a leaf and hold the magnifying glass, let the sun go through the magnifying glass, and the leaf would catch on fire. Am I the only one, or some of you can remember that? <laughs> All right, good. Why do I raise that? Because that's like hope. Hope focuses our energy like the magnifying glass focuses the sun to channel the heat and begin the fire. It's hope that drives us. It burns deep down inside of us. As someone said, it is hope that gets us out of bed in the morning and shapes the whole contours of our day. So Jesus said, lift up your heads. Stop looking around. Stop wondering and worrying. Lift up your heads. Look up. In the city that was once Constantinople, a visitor to the mosque of St. Sophia stood quietly for some time, just marveling at the breathtaking architecture. The mosque had formerly been a Christian church, but had long since been converted into a Mohammedan place of worship, and all the Christian symbols had been wiped out and painted over and covered with Arabic lettering. But on this day, as the visitor stood there, he looked up at the dome, and when he did, his heart almost stopped because there, there he saw that centuries of cover-up paint that had been added over the years was wearing off, and the figure of Christ was beginning to be seen again. And with excitement, he grabbed the arm of his fellow traveler, and he said, Look, look, he's coming again. Jesus is coming again. What a picture. Yes, he's coming again. Of course, Jesus is showing through. He's always showing through. We can't wipe him out. We can't cover him up. We can't make him disappear. We can't erase him from our midst. He is always there. The brokenness of our world will end because the Son of Man is coming. God has not made his last visit to our world. As we sang so wonderfully a few moments ago, Jesus alone is our only hope. So we are driven by hope, even in the midst of a world which often seems hopeless. The despair will come to an end. Degeneration is a part of every generation. But we must not lose ourselves in bemoaning the current state of affairs. Rather, let the times remind us of our need for a Savior. Let them point us again to Jesus. Jesus is asking us to trust him. So when the quakes shake and the mud slides and hundreds are killed and thousands are homeless, when the grieving piles up, when our lives are in radical crisis, when our world is crashing, Jesus says it's a sign. Something, someone greater is coming is on the way. New life and redemption will occur. History has a goal. I am Lord of all. See this as an opportunity to refocus on me. Trust me. Pastor Larry Michael told of visiting a Mrs. Blackburn, an elderly woman of his congregation who had lived through a great deal of adversity. In fact, she had also outlived the doctor who several years before had said, her case was terminal. One day, he began to speak to her about death and the process of death. She said to him she was not afraid of death, but rather she preferred to concentrate on the Bible's promises of Christ's return. And then she said confidently, I'm not looking for the undertaker. I'm looking for the upper taker. Look up and trust in Jesus. He's our firm hope. This is a time now for hope. But Jesus also said this is a time now to live with purpose. Matthew and Mark also include these words of Jesus, but they have longer dialogue. They concentrate more on the specifics of the end of the age, but Luke makes it very personal and deals with the now. Verse 28. When, 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 when these things begin, begin to take place, Stand up and lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. Stand up, get busy, 
live with a sense of urgency. The life of a disciple is not one of speculation and observation, but of behavior. While we wonder, when will God come? God is wondering, when are you going to reach the point when I can finally come? So how should we conduct ourselves in preparation for and to hasten Christ's return? When the early church struggled along with us with the question of when will God come, Peter gave this answer, 2 Peter 3, beginning of verse 9. The Lord is not slow to do what he has promised, as some think. Instead, he is patient with you, because he does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants all to turn away from their sins. What kind of people should you be? Your lives should be holy and dedicated to God, as you wait for the day of God and do your best to make it come soon. Peter had learned from Jesus, who gave us some instruction on how to behave. Following the the verses that we read, he tells a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. When they sprout leaves, you can see for yourselves and know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that the kingdom of God is near. And then he gave the application. Be always on the watch and pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen. Jesus said there is a time now for witness, a time to stand. When these things begin to take place, stand up. In the 1987 NCAA Regional Basketball Finals, LSU was leading Indiana by eight points with just a few minutes left in the game. But as sometimes happens with teams in the lead, they began to play very tentatively. Even the television announcers pointed out that the LSU players seemed to be more watching the clock rather than wholeheartedly playing the game. And the end result was Indiana came back to win and went on to become NCAA champions. There's a lesson there for us. While Jesus calls us to be aware of the signs of the time, he clearly also calls us to expend our energies in faithful, active service. As we await Jesus' promised return, we are not so much to watch the clock as to be diligent servants during the time we have available. The kingdom of God is within us. We have all we need. Never forget that the kingdom of God is never darkness. It is always light. It is never death. It is always life. And our dark world needs light and life. So everywhere we go, in everything we do, we lovingly speak the name of Jesus and witness to him. Great scene in the third chapter of the book of Acts after the recording of what happened in Pentecost. After Jesus' ascension in Pentecost, Peter was confronted by a beggar as he was on his way into the temple, Acts 3, 6. And Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. That's the boldness with which we can and must live I love how the contemporary song puts it so powerfully. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind because I know there is peace within your presence. I just want to speak the name of Jesus till every dark addiction starts to break, declaring there is hope and there is freedom. Break every stronghold, shine through the shadows, burn like a fire. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over fear and all anxiety to every soul held captive by depression. I speak Jesus. Shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy, Jesus for my family. I speak the holy name, Jesus, because your name is power, your name is healing, Your name is life. We speak the name of Jesus. We witness in and through Jesus' name. There is a time for witness to stand. And says Jesus, there is time for work, for action and deeds. And the time is now. 
when these things begin to take place, stand up and lift up your heads. Lift up your heads not only to see the hope that we have in Jesus, but to see the needs of others all around us. Do good to others. There's a couple of verses in Acts which I've always marveled at because of their simplicity, but their power and beauty in which we so seldom seem to hear. Acts 10, 37 and 38. You know what has happened throughout the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good. If Jesus went around doing good, should not we do the same? Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 16, he said, In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25, Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that confess his name, and do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. Titus chapter 2, verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all unwickedness, to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good? And we heard it earlier from 1 Thessalonians 5. We do not belong to the darkness. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up. In that spirit, CRC pastor, Reverend Jim Cock, who was very significant in my life as he was the chaplain who oversaw my clinical pastoral education when I was in seminary, wrote a stirring book that I just discovered a couple of weeks ago. It's called The Miracle of Kindness, Changing the World One Act at a Time. I know you heard a sermon on kindness just a couple of weeks ago, but I need to lift up this quote from his book. Jim said, every day is packed with opportunities. Every person we meet needs a word, a touch, a smile, a lift. Care and kindness is the love of God, the spirit of Jesus flowing through us. There are friends to call, neighbors to visit, sick to write to, and injured to pray for. So give what you have. Do what you do in the name of Jesus. Freely and boldly give your Christ-like loving smile. Offer your divine word of encouragement. Give your holy, comforting presence, your spirit-filled gift of hospitality, your biblical wisdom, your godly love, your loyal friendship, your patient listening ear, your gracious understanding, your bent toward acts of kindness and goodness, your heart for children, your skills for building, your time for tutoring, give a hug, share a fist pump, do good. Now is the time. It's a time for witness, for action and doing good. And Jesus said it's a time for prayer. Verse 36, be always on the watch and pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen. We pray so that the coming of Jesus again will not overwhelm us and the judgment will not overtake us. Hold on to the spiritual dimension of life. Prayer at its noblest is not us trying to get something from God, but is that which brings us closer to God. As the psalmist proclaimed it in Psalm 91, He will spread His wings over you and keep you secure. His faithfulness is like a shield or a city wall. You won't need to worry about dangers at night or arrows during the day. 
And you won't fear diseases that strike in the dark or sudden disaster at noon. You will not be harmed, though thousands fall all around you. And with your own eyes you will see the punishment of the wicked. The Lord Most High is your fortress. Run to Him for safety. And no terrible disasters will strike you or your home. God will command His angels to protect you wherever you go. They will carry you in their arms. And you won't hurt your feet on the stones. Here and here alone lies our safety and our strength. And here's where it all comes home. Our behavior, our witnessing, our action, our praying makes now a time for anticipation. When will Jesus come again? Only God knows. But that's okay because we know our future. Verse 36, be always on the watch and pray that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man anticipate standing before the Lord Jesus Christ and hearing these words, well done, good and faithful servant, come and share your master's happiness. Live lovingly and faithfully here and now, and it leads to the rich blessing of our Lord in the hereafter. The great opera star Jenny Lind used to sit alone for a few moments in her dressing room before a performance. And then she would strike one clear, vibrant note and hold it as long as she could. And then she would say, Master, let me ring true tonight. Let me ring true as thou art true. Jesus is saying, ring true. Ring true until he comes. Ring true so that he comes. Ring true. If you have never given Jesus permission to be Lord of your life, do it this morning and start ringing. If Jesus is already Lord of your life, ring louder, clearer, stronger than ever before. Stand up and lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. Stand up and let it be today we shout the hymn of heaven. With angels and the saints, let's raise a mighty roar. Glory to our God who gave his life beyond the grave because holy, holy, holy is the Lord. When will he come? I don't know. But let's ring true. Let's pray. Father in heaven, it's so easy to get caught up in what's happening all around us, what's happening to us. But our focus needs to be on you. So Holy Spirit, move powerfully. Touch our hearts. Stir within us the hope and the anticipation that we have and send us forth to do good in the name of Jesus Christ by whose power we live and through whose power the world will be redeemed. Stir us, O God, through Jesus Christ our Lord in whom we pray. Amen. Amen.